When it comes Obito. to Naruto characters, yes. I feel like Obito Uchiha is equally as misunderstood by the Naruto fandom oh, as Sakura yes. Harano is hated by the Naruto fandom. So in today's latest video, I want to take another deep dive into my Path of the Tyrant series. And it's in this edition, I want to take a deeper look at Obito's character. Diving right in, in order for us to fully understand Obito as a character, we have to go back to Obito's youth. But when we do so, this isn't just going to be your run of the mill, this is how the character started out type of a video, but instead we're going to look at it from the framework and the scope of Joseph Campbell's book titled The Hero's Journey, which is a layout of the stages that a hero in literature tends to go through as they progress through their story, i.e. for example, Naruto's journey starting in chapter 1, being a talentless loser, to chapter 700 where Naruto is the Hokage of the village. Now, every hero's journey starts out with some type of call to action and progresses through the 12 major steps of the journey. However, the path of the tyrant is something a little different and it truly begins once the hero steps off of the hero's journey at some point and they begin to walk the path of the tyrant. In their mind, the villain is merely the hero of their own story. They truly believe that what they're doing is for the greater good of the world, that they're so focused on achieving their goal that they don't see that they've begun to cross moral lines or even worse, they're aware of the lines that they're crossing and they don't care because the end justifies the means. This is where the character Obito Uchiha comes into play. Despite being a relatively kind-hearted child in nature, somebody wanting to one day become the Hokage of his village, Obito, when you really look at his character objectively, was always destined to become a lost soul who spent a majority of his life walking the path of the tyrant. It would be after he awakened his Sharingan and saved Kakashi that Obito's journey to the path of the tyrant would truly begin. This stage is what I like to refer to as the temptation stage. So the temptation stage is where the tyrant either sees something that he or she lacks or something that he or she needs in order to get more power to achieve a goal. This could be something as small as winning the affection of a woman, protecting people that you care for, or building a better world. For the case of Obito, Rin was both the light of his world as well as the catalyst for his descent into darkness and Rin represented all three of these triggers that exist inside of the temptation stage. If you look at the manga, one of Obito's final regrets was that he never got to tell Rin about his feelings for him, which obviously Obito hoped that Rin would return. The last image of Rin that he saw was that his love was being saved by someone he considered his rival. This leads to the next trigger of wanting power to protect those that you care for. Obito in this moment was too weak to overcome his current circumstances. The boulders were falling on top of him. He was utterly helpless in the situation. He was too weak to prevent Rin from being kidnapped. Too weak to save both Kakashi and himself and now his lack of power seemingly would kill him and ultimately it would keep him away from Rin. Building a better world is also tied to Rin because you have moments where it becomes clear that Rin believed in Obito from the moment that she told him that she would always be watching him to the undertone of Minato telling Obito that they'll both become Hokage so the women that they care for would acknowledge them. Obito wanted to become Hokage in that world where Rin actually existed with her ideally going from somebody that was watching him to standing beside him. Now this brings us to the next stage of the path of the tyrant which is referred to as the other side or what I like to call the fall from grace. So it's in the stage that the hero becomes lost either symbolically or literally in the chaos around them. Despite the fallen hero having good intentions for what he hopes to achieve, he either falls victim to a more powerful and more evil being giving him the tools and power needed to make his dream a reality or he becomes corrupted by the power that's given to him. For Obito, he initially resisted Madara's talks of a world without winners and losers. His mind was solely on getting strong enough to help Kakashi bring out the full power of the Sharingan and with added emphasis on Kishimoto each time this was mentioned, Kishimoto made it very clear Obito wanted to protect Rin. Rin is what drove him to get stronger. She was a beacon of light during this dark time, yet it would be her death that pushed Obito into the arms of Madara. Symbolically, Obito made this choice when he gave into his urge to slaughter the Mist Ninja. However, I feel a lot of fans truly miss the beauty of this vengeful scene that sets up the heartbreaking moments afterwards with Rin and the deep symbolism that you get in that scene. Just as for the hero, there comes a time for a choice to be made by the fallen hero who is on the path of the tyrant. For Obito, symbolically, this choice was made when he gave in to his rage to slaughter the Mist Ninja in revenge for the woman that he loved. The girl who represented so much of his heart and his innocence as a child, though he brutally killed all of them, the amount of blood that he spilled didn't bring back the girl who Obito loved, which is why he clings so desperately to her body so tightly. When you look at the manga version of the story, you can get a very clear picture of what 
I mean. When Obito saw Ren's dead body, it was more than just looking at the corpse of a friend or a romantic interest. It was Masashi Kishimoto's way of symbolically showing Obito looking at what's left of his humanity. Months of training to get strong enough in order to get back to Ren had resulted in her death. Holding on to Ren was Obito desperately trying to hold on to his own humanity, which was leaving his body just as quickly as the warmth was leaving Ren's body. It's why you see Obito's hands shaking as he reaches to touch Ren, just as his own Mangekyo Sharingan powers have yet to stabilize, which is why we see Obito lose control when his hand passes through her when he attempts to touch Ren. So too was Obito's soul also struggling to keep itself together. The way the lines on his face were drawn, twisted in agony, and the sheer brilliance of the paneling in this scene leads to the heartbreaking moment where Obito is cradling Ren's lifeless body. It was in this moment that Obito consciously made the decision now that his heart had been destroyed that he will follow Madara's plan because Ren was dead. However, I find a lot of fans miss the true weight of this scene where Obito says he's going to build a world where Ren exists again. Masashi Kishimoto reflected the carnage and bloodshed around Obito as he stated that he was in hell. He did this as a way to mirror Obito's soul going from the kind young boy full of hope, full of high expectations to being a full-on lost soul. When Obito says let's create a world where you can exist again, it isn't just a dream world where Obito can see her again like all the infinite Tsukiyomi dreams, but it's also a world free from the war and violence that separated him from Ren and ultimately took her away from him. He would be creating a world in a manner that mirrored the qualities that he believed that Ren embodied due to his infatuation with her. Ren was too pure of a soul in his eyes to have existed in this world of chaos that saw children being sent to the battlefield to be killed all in the name of furthering the goals of a nation. No, the world that Obito would build in Ren's memory would prevent another Ren no horror from dying. This brings us to the also important step, which is called the Dark Path. Now, it's on this step that the hero is reborn into a tyrant. They master the new abilities and they overcome challenges. Everything, every choice is made for the sole intent of them accomplishing their goal. In classic literature, this would be where a man dies only to be reborn as a vampire. But for Obito, this moment is when he began under his training with Madara, where Madara used Genjutsu to pass on his teachings to Obito. It's at this point that the Obito of the past begins to take his last breaths, and this new Obito would spend years that followed mastering the abilities that were given to him, from the Sharingan abilities to the Hashirama cells to the knowledge that Madara passed down to him. Even the dark verbiage that Madara's silver tongue was able to use was being perfected as Obito was shown being able to recruit Nagato, and his powers would be further tested when he used Sharingan Genjutsu to control a perfect Jinchuriki. And the symbolism here is very important because he used the Mizukage to bring terror to the very village of ninja that took his love from him and essentially changed Obito's life for the worse. Even after all these years, Ren still lingered inside of Obito. Now, this next step is is where we highlight the true beauty of Obito's character. This is the phase known as rejection. Now it's here that the hero is at the height of his powers and he's offered a chance for redemption or an act of God moment occurs that should make him reconsider the path that he's on. For Obito, this act of God moment was when he lost Nagato after the Akatsuki had captured most of the Biju while also popping up on the radar of all five great nations. Nagato, who was the also important pawn that Obito possessed, was now dead betraying Obito. Sasuke, according to Obito, was not yet ready to take Nagato's place. Typically at this stage, the villain stubbornly pushes past the point of no return and kills whoever's in his way, in particular anyone making a push for them to give up. In this case, you also see this when Conan refused to give him the location of the Rinnegan and referred to Naruto as a light and it pushed Obito deeper down the path of the tyrant while I believe subconsciously making him recall Madara's speech about lightness and darkness. Seven 17 years after Ren died, a brand new light had come to replace Ren in Obito's orbit. Whereas she was the light that shined a path forward towards him doing the right things, walking the right path, Naruto Uzumaki was now the light shining through the darkness all the way through Obito's actions and slowly guiding Obito to both his eventual defeat as well as his return to the hero's journey. The sheer brilliance in this becomes even greater and even clearer when you realize the symbolism of Naruto being a parallel to Obito, a representation of Obito 
Obito's life if he had stayed on the hero's journey. Like every house that a tyrant builds, the house that Obito built was destined to crumble because anything built on soil that was defiled with blood of the innocent and ashes from the bones of the dead is always going to crumble because it has a cracked foundation. It was through the light that came from Naruto and shined in Obito's darkness that his precious pawns in the Akatsuki were mostly wiped out by Naruto himself or by people who basked in the glory of Naruto's light. This is why Obito tried so desperately to corrupt Naruto during the war, going so far as to kill Neji in front of him, bragging about killing Naruto's parents and using every small advantage that came to him, trying to make Naruto step off the hero's journey, which is something that Madara noted when he noted how Obito was speaking to Naruto the same way that Madara spoke to Obito. However, the irony in this is that Obito only succeeded in pushing himself down to the next step of the hero's journey, which is called the diminishment. So it's at this stage that the villain loses their most precious belonging, whether it be a friend, a lover, or in the case of Obito, this would be a dream. Obito had crossed the path of no return by starting a war against the five great nations. And as a result of his alliance with Kabuto, Madara Uchiha was now revived. Madara, the true owner of the Rinnegan, made it known to Obito that he expected to be revived properly by usage of the outer path, better known to fans as the Rinne Rebirth, to which Obito stated more than once that he refused to throw his life away in order to revive Madara. The reason being is that Obito wanted to be the one who became the Jinsuriki of the Ten Tails and cast the infant Tsukiyomi. He wanted to be the one who created the future, the future world where there would be no war, no pain, no suffering, no winners, no losers. A world where innocent lives like Rin's didn't have to die. However, in the blink of an eye, Obito's dream was ripped from him as he was forced to revive Madara, betrayed at the very end by the one who seduced him into the darkness. Obito was forced to watch as Zetsu was the only thing keeping him from dying after using the Rinne Rebirth. Zetsu attacked Obito's best friend and his former sensei. Even though he briefly regained consciousness and tried to make amends for what he'd done, Obito was still in the process of losing himself completely and eventually he would cede control of his body to Black Zetsu until being discarded upon Kaguya's rebirth. Now, this leads us to the final step of the Path of the Tyrant, which is referred to as fate. It's in this stage that the walls begin to close in. Enemies begin to come for the Tyrant, which leads to either a villain being killed or destroying himself through his own actions, either literally or symbolically. It's in this moment that the villain faces themselves in the mirror, facing their own regrets, their shortcomings, their failed goals, and realizing that what they did was wrong. It's here that they wonder, was the journey truly worth it? Was it worth the pain and the suffering that was caused and endured? For Obito, after Naruto managed to extend his life very briefly, Obito knew that he was on borrowed time. Zetsu specifically stated that Obito would have died from using the outer path. He was only being kept alive because Zetsu was keeping Obito alive. When you look at it, the moment that Zetsu detached himself, Obito was well on his way to death. And if we take Obito's words literally in Naruto chapter 683, Obito flat out states that he had died. It's in the moments afterwards that a lot of fans miss this scene, where Naruto says that he healed Obito, but what a lot of fans miss is the exchange right afterwards. Naruto then stops and has a sad expression on his face and is unable to look Obito in the eyes and he only says one word. Now that word hangs heavy in the air with only expressions from Naruto and Obito to convey the true gravity of their meaning. Obito's face is being drawn with a very sad and weighty appearance as he looks over at Kakashi before he then closes his eyes and simply states I know. Those are the words of a man who knows that he's on borrowed time. Naruto was able to stop the effects of the 8th gate but he was not able to stop the effects of the outer path which we know from Naruto data before this Jutsu sends the soul of the user directly to the afterlife. For Obito, with what little life that he had, he spent it devoted to helping Naruto, which is very important. Because you see, Naruto is the one whose light Obito now believed would light the way forward towards building the world that he envisioned and creating in Ren's memory. Obito understood that for all of Naruto's powers, Obito's own death could not be avoided. This is what makes his sacrifice in Naruto chapter 687 so damn beautiful. Because this is Obito dying as a tyrant who's accepted the 
error of his ways, saying that this is the death that's fitting of a criminal. Just as Luke Skywalker removed Vader's helmet, Anakin Skywalker is the one who ended up returning in the end. So too is this the case here. Obito was dying as a tyrant, openly admitting his regrets to Naruto, but just before he passed on, a lot of fans missed this, but his final memory was of the girl that he loved, taking his hand, and the light that guided him for so long, Rin. Rin would take his hand before he went into the afterlife. His final words were to Naruto, who was the new light that destroyed everything it built in the darkness after Obito lost his first light. Obito with a smile passed on into the afterlife, redeemed by standing in front of the new light that's known as Naruto Uzumaki. It's directly after this that Obito meets Rin again in the afterlife, too ashamed to look her in the eyes, but there's a lot more to this scene. Obito is now back in his teenage form. It's the perfect symbolism to show that the darkness of his soul had been fully removed by Naruto's light. And the reunion with Rin is even more touching when you consider this next thing. Rin was the light that guided him onto his first hero's journey. Her death was the diminishing light that led him down to the path of the tyrant. And now in the afterlife, her soul was guiding him towards the next adventure. But this time, what he desired most is what was given to him. Rin, who who had watched him all this time from the afterlife and as they stepped into their next journey they would do so holding hands with Ren once again guiding him forward and that's gonna be it for this newest installment of the path of the tyrant obviously I don't do these videos every single week or whatnot because these videos take a lot of research and as you guys can tell these videos are longer than usual so make sure you smash that like button and I'm gonna thank the hell out of whoever edits this for me because I know this was a monster of a video to do so make sure you hit that like button and leave your comments down in the comment section for who you want me to cover on the path of the tyrant next but as always guys if you like anything i had to say don't forget to comment rate subscribe and share thank you so much for watching until the end have an awesome day guys wow.